Uh, so actually, um, uh, it's a nice segue uh, between uh, Joanne's talk and my own. Uh, often I, I serve just as the MC, but today I'm going to have a talk with some content in it. Uh, because uh, when we talk about genetics, it's nice for you to know that actually we're doing lots of studies that try to use the genetic information to um, help us understand these disorders better. And one of them that's fairly new and I think going to be very helpful is this, uh, these studies that are just starting in the last couple of years of familial disorders. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about a familial study of frontotemporal lobar degeneration. There are uh, several families that I know um, in, the, uh, in the group who are affected by these disorders. These are uh, due to abnormal proteins like Alzheimer's, but it's a different set of proteins or uh, different in many ways. And the symptoms are different. These are the disorders for those who don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. Instead of presenting with memory disorders, one might have language, dis language problems, uh, what we call aphasia, or problems with social and emotional problems. And, and although it's less common as a general cause of dementia, probably it is quite common FTLD as a cause in those who are getting dementia under the age of 65. So um, it's still very important. And, and um, uh, about, so in Alzheimer's disease, these uh, very major, the major changes are only account for about 1% of Alzheimer's disease. But in front of temporal degeneration, it's more like 15%. So the, the contribution from these major changes is higher, although still the majority are sporadic. And again, as you know, 50% uh, of people in such a family are at risk. And there are actually several different kinds of mutations. Most are caused, the most common is caused by these, the, this uh, mutation called the C9 or 72 over here. These are details that actually um, you don't need to know very much about. And there are some less common mutations. And different families are affected by different mutations. But the point is that each of these mutations has its own biology. If, you're, if you have a mutation in one kind of gene, it means you're getting the same disease from a specific biological reason. And if you have a different mutation, the biology is slightly different. And, um, sorry, I keep pressing the button accidentally. So, um, uh, so ultimately, we want to develop biological treatments that are specific to whatever the mechanism that's causing your problem. And that's an example of this precision medicine approach that Dr. Miller was talking about. So why are, it's, why are these uh, patients and these families really uh, quite important for our studies of these uh, of treatments is because, um, first of all, if you have a specific biology and a drug company or one of our colleagues has a specific agent and they say, we think it's going to help this biology, then we can say, well, if we recruit people from one of these families with this exact type of major change, then we can guarantee that all of those people should have the same kind of biology that you're talking about and make them homogeneous for a study. Another, so that's really important. And then another one is, yeah, uh, another reason is that, um, is that this is currently the only situation where we can actually figure out if a treatment's doing anything before somebody gets symptoms. Uh, because we know exactly who is, is going to get symptoms, although we don't always know when, and, we, and who is basically at the same risk as everybody else. Um, and so because of that logic, I think it's really important to stress that these kinds of studies don't just help families affected by these diseases, but it helps us understand probably how these degenerative diseases sets in, in all of us. Um, it, and it's just that we don't know among us who is going to be facing this problem and who won't, so it's a harder study to do. Um, and actually, this same concept is being addressed in Alzheimer's through other studies of the major changes in Alzheimer's. One example is a study called Diane, and another study is the one that was on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago. Uh, people saw that uh, about the study uh, of the family down in Columbia. Same logic, but there, is a there they're doing a major change in Alzheimer's. Here we're focusing on FTLD. So the logic of these studies often you know, looks like this, is that you're born with a mutation. It's sitting there, that major change. For some reason, you know, you, 
for some reason, you, you can do fine with it for quite a while. Maybe you're changing a little bit more quickly than other people. We don't know. But basically, you seem to be doing fine. And then something happens in your biology that makes it so that all of a sudden, you're not dealing well with this anymore. And you're on this path to being ill more quickly. Um, and so what? So um, this whole study is involved. Uh, the idea is that we want to uh, examine people in all of these different phases of the illness. Because if we want to treat people in this stage with the red bars, the, the red lines, right, then things might be changing more quickly. We have to know how quickly they change so we can know if the drug is helping them. In this earlier stage, if things are changing detectably at all, we have to know how fast because it, it's a different kind of challenge to know if the drug is helping in this stage. So, so that's one important thing. And the second important thing is to know when this change is going to happen. And if, and if it really, the way I'm designing things, the way I'm uh, uh, hypothesizing things go, whether this indeed is how it looks, and if that change is coming, having the, the predictors of when it's going to happen. Because one of the things in FTLD is, is that even though everybody who carries that gene is at very high risk, the age of onset can be quite variable. So some people can get it in their 40s or 50s, and some people can get it in their 80s. And we still don't know the, the science to predict which people will get it when. So that, we, we think it's probably due to an accumulation of minor changes in addition to the major change, and maybe environmental factors too. And so we, we want to try to measure those things. So fortunately, in the last couple of years, two studies have been funded that are going to allow us to do that. One is called Lefties. For, and that's what it stands for. One is called ARFL, and that's what it stands for. And together, these two studies are assembling uh, a consortium of centers from around the country and Canada to try to um, analyze exactly the sets of questions that I've answered. And I want to point out that there's lots of other foundations that have, uh, so the major funders of National's NINDS, this, which stands for that, and National Institute on Aging. And, um, and uh, um, those studies are, uh, and lots of other foundations are also helping to support this effort, including the Tau Consortium and the uh, uh, Bluefield Project that Dr. Miller was mentioning. And so what we're doing is we're studying people from these families, both people who already have symptoms as well as people who don't have symptoms, and we're following them over time to see how much change we can detect over the short period of three or four years. Because um, uh, that's how long we get a study funded for. Um, and hopefully we can renew it to keep studying these folks, but that's what we get for now. Um, and so we have three time points in person where we examine them, we do cognitive testing, we do brain imaging, blood testing. Many of you are familiar with these protocols, they're the same kind of things we do whenever we study these issues. And so what we're really trying to do is exactly what I said. Characterize the rates of change in this phase when you don't have symptoms, characterize the the rates of change when you do have symptoms, and I guarantee we'll be able to do those tasks, and hopefully identify some predictors of whether that change is coming, which is, I think, the most challenging, but one of the most important parts of the study. And this, and as I said, it really um, it requires a, a group to do this, because people from these families live all around the country, and our, our colleagues have been um, um, very uh, uh, helpful in wanting to participate in the study. Um, and, uh, and we've made good progress so far. So in the last sort of two and a half years that the study was started, um, you know, we've now uh, gotten a, a little uh, around a little more than half of to, up to our goal of recruitment. We've recruited 260 people from these families, and they are distributed among these three major types of genes that I alluded to before. Um, and we already see evidence that some of our uh, expectations are uh, detectable. So, um, the, for example, this is uh, graphs of how much the frontal lobes change depending on whether you have symptoms or not, and we divide the symptoms into four groups. So these, black, in this black bar, are people who don't even carry the gene. That's how much their brain changes in a, in a year. Um, it's brain shrinkage. Um, so you see there's a little bit in everybody. Uh, these are people who don't have the, who have the gene but don't have any symptoms that we can detect. These are, these are people who, uh, have some symptoms, uh, but they're very mild, and these are people who have you know, more easy to detect symptoms. So you can see that this kind of graph that I laid out really appears to be true, where we're starting to see differences in how much one changes 
even over the course of a year, depending on how you're doing in, in the LA. And, and so that's just a little taste of the data that's coming out of these studies, and, and uh, we expect much more to come over time. And I want to thank, I'm sure that there are members from these families in the audience, and uh, I want to thank you very much for being involved in these studies, and everybody else for helping us to get to the point where we could do studies like this. And um, we'll have more to say about the results in the future. So thanks. <laughs>